All right, we're just getting ready to start our residence panel. Um, they can each make a brief statement if they'd like to, and then it's just going to be basically question and answer. You can ask anything you want. Um, one thing to keep in mind is there, there is no uh, prearranged um, agreement on answers or anything. So any any given person may answer, you know, may give an answer that might contradict what another uh, resident gives. But they're all giving they're all giving answers based on their own subjective experiences. So. Um, Oh, he, he, he knew wise enough to, to disappear. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if you guys are ready, I'll just turn it over to you. Um, you can make a very brief statement. Very brief. <laughs> uh, so, he likes the podium, man. Hi, guys. So, I've been a resident since February 2015. I'm one of the original people still here from the Recall Walker event. Um, basically, basically, what we want to do is, you know, fight the cause for an equal right to housing between an individual's right, based on wage or no wage, based on disability or no disability. There has to be a housing, a housing control line between people and the cities to be aware of an individual's right to have housing based on everyone pays taxes, there's a capital and budget bill, and what that money is spent on needs to be developed federally for each side of the city and the communities, but then everyone forgets about the, that individual for housing. So where people are in life, they choose to like to ignore that other percentage of people that are homeless. And that's, that's the majority where a lot of people having the problem to find resources to actually find a job, get to their appointments, pay, look for a place to live. But it's so expensive in different cities, in this one too, that there's a lot of issues with the men and women's shelter, a lot of issues between getting a job, getting to it, getting your your appointments, finding an apartment. But right now, for this community, for Occupy, it's a fighting cause to help other advocates and homeless people fight the right for housing for homeless people. And I'm wrapping it up because I'll just talk all day. But this is one of the reasons why we're here, is to show the city in other cities that uh, there needs to be more occupied movements like this one that we've learned from Wall Street. And I'll pass. Questions? No. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, Luca. Luca's right there. Yeah, That's the way they're doing it. All right, I'll pass. Where is the revenue coming from for setting up additional houses and paying the collective utility bill? So, becoming a resident, um, we have some guideline rules. As uh, you want to be a member, um, you have to participate in two general membership meetings. Uh, we encourage you after the first general membership to start uh, volunteering so we get to know you uh, before we can vote you in just to you know give us some background information as what uh, why you want to be a member uh, why do you want to be in this organization or why do you want to be involved but then that gives us some background information about you to get to know you and then your sweat ethic hours start as to volunteer hours um, I believe the tiny house contract is around 150 hours um, when there's a tiny house available, and it's up to 500 hours as sweat equity hours, volunteer hours, um, once you sign a contract for a tiny house to live in. Um, the bills here are basically all from the store as well items we make and donation money and private donors. 
But is there a budget for additional houses? So the project is designed for nine tiny <coughs> houses here. And it has been in uh, different meetings over the years to expand uh, for our campus, but the issues is in our work groups is our capacity levels. They actually push us more, they actually do more, but a lot of us get burnt out, so we just try to stay within one, two, three, four people in a work group um, based on you know, what is needed in skill level has to do the job for voluntary work groups. Luca? Yeah, I have a, this is gonna seem unbelievable, but I've actually, we've actually never spoken about this before. I'm curious, what are the frustrations in living in a space that small? Each one of you can say your own. Mine is not the space. Mine is waking up in the middle of the night and want to pee and have to go outside and then I'll pee. <laughs> <laughs> That's my, my, it's the only issue I have. Yeah, mostly in the winter time, you know. I hate it. <laughs> I would too. Each yeah. tiny house so is about 99 square feet on the inside. So each steward, once you design or build your Swedeki hours up, you get to design the inside of the tiny house how you want to live. So you could have you can have a single bed or a laptop craft desk or a bunk bed or a double bed or a pull-out loft or a dresser or a couch or end table, bookshelf, refrigerator, <coughs> microwave. You can change all these items and try to fit into a living comfortable area with 99 square feet to work with. So some of us, we've done this. And we have our tiny house tour coming up again. So right now, I have a seven foot couch, a bookshelf, a double bed, extended loft, <laughs> end, <laughs> end tables, I got a dresser, I got a laundry area, and I got a refrigerator. And you can almost get a house. And I have a vacuum. <laughs> so, I mean, as long as you think about or draw it out or feel where you feel comfortably living in a tiny house, which way, which side and front, back, you know, or upstairs, it's all on the individual as to design it themselves to live in a tiny house. That's what the gift is, as once you become a steward, you get to design your own tiny house inside. Do you sleep up in the loft? I have before. Is it, does it get hot? In the summertime. Yeah. Yeah. In the winter. You know, winter problems also. In the winter, if you leave your heater on. Bob. Yeah, you've been at this for like seven, six or seven years now. I have a question about like the, the broader homeless community. Because I've been following the story in Wausau where the city council passed an ordinance to find homeless people found. Uh, foul sleeping in the parking lot. And if you ever read the comments and news stories on Facebook, I mean, it's a horror show. And just listening to the attitudes of people in the community toward homeless people, how do you like, how do you fight that? I mean, these people have some horrendously bad so, attitudes um, about homeless people. We're all equal. Doesn't yeah. matter what the reason why a person is homeless. Um, we, there's a divorce. Bank accounts are frozen. Uh, not in a lease on an apartment. So you're kicked out on the street uh, from a different city or state coming here. Uh, college student. Don't have uh, no work experience. Um, but I got work experience, so I get the job. But there's different reasons why a person would be homeless. Um, it's the down part where people feel they can criticize an individual for their own right to realize that why is our town or city village bad? Because of resources or is it the people? Well, uh, you know, answer the, answering your question, you know, I know lately I think because of the, the face of homelessness has changed. Before, you know, uh, now it's completely, I mean, it can happen to anybody they ought to check a way of becoming homeless. Right. And I think now because of the, the face of cha uh, has changed, 
I think, you know, there's still a lot of people that are horribly, you know, towards the, you know, the, 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 the problem, but, um, but there's a lot of people that are still willing to help, you know. I think it's education. I think that's what will change, you know, the attitudes that people have towards certain people, certain homelessness. It's not I think it's any better either. No, but it's education. It's all we can do, you know, excuse me. It's all we can do about it. So well, to educate people that it can happen to anyone. Also through, uh, a lot of it's because of stereotypes, right? Right. Like the media, like you have the situation at the, at the top of State Street and it just gets blown out of proportion and, um, but you don't hear about like Occupy and Equal where we're engaging with our neighbors, where we're, um, where we're, uh, pushing cars out of the intersection when it floods, you know, um, it's, a, it's a twice a year event for More us. More you know, than sometimes. Just, we just go out and push, you know, we, and, and like, so like Sophia was saying, the face has changed and, and those stereotypes go away when people are living, living around us and we have, we've had neighbors that, um, I'm looking to see it, you know, like Heidi and Link will come and trick or treat and, um, and they know it's uh, perfectly safe, and and um, and we don't have the police calls and the incidents, so it's just breaking down those stereotypes and, and engaging with people. Yeah, we never had the police call here in five years that we've been here. Just, we? just that one bad neighbor. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Because in the, there, yeah. The planer gets a little. Compared to certain okay. other places here in Madison, where homelessness, you know, where people were homeless before. It's totally different, our situation, when it comes to that. Does anybody have any more questions? Go ahead. Do you heat the houses with electricity? Mm -hmm. So each tiny house yeah. is plugged in. Yes. We have the fence line running electricity to each tiny house. And they get hot. And each <laughs> tiny house has a, a heater with the tiny house as when the steward first moves in. Excuse me. Um, it's like a dial between zero to three and between around one and a half to two. <laughs> That's all I need. Yeah. I mean, it's really hot. I mean, it gets about to almost 80 some degrees it in, there in there. It gets hot in for a good to, couple hours. A door a couple of times and it's got a temperature before. gauge on the inside, so it'll turn itself off. It is really well insulated between the ceiling, the walls, and the floor. Yeah. And each sorry, each tiny house is around three thousand dollars in materials by itself. So, so do you guys get into conflicts with each other, and how do you resolve? Oh yeah. <laughs> so like family, man. When, um, of course we do. When we have a discussion, we. Uh, don't agree or disagree. Um, I like to raise money or <laughs> ask the community for help based on decisions. Like we had this um, cloth that we got to do a banner with OM on a oh tablecloth. Oh stuck with it. <laughs> we wanted to put about two hundred twenty dollars for it when we can make a lot of cotton, a couple sheets together, sew it together, put our OM logo on it, and we're done. But we have to make a custom <laughs> tablecloth for Occupy Mass and spend outrageous money when lots of people know how to use a sewing machine. There. Yeah, that's yes, we have lots of conflicts and it's all about. <laughs> and we're about to have a conflict. <laughs> yes. And so the dishes. volunteer yeah. comes in and yeah. 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 Dishes, it's a huge problem yeah. here. Um, dishes <laughs> are a nightmare on potlucks at the end of potlucks. <laughs> so uh, I like to overcook on yeah. the potlucks, but then everybody eats really good, but then the sink is left with the dishes. <laughs> is there any more? So what would you say has been like the, the change that stands out to you over five years? Like oh, over five years, yeah. there's well, trust. I between an individual knowing I can rely on and depend on where I can count on someone. And that's where that good neighbor policy comes into play into trusting someone to be there. 
and trusting someone to be there. And I also like that the residents are more involved in the decisions making, you know. So I, I kind of like that, that, you know, that we're more involved in that area too. Hi. Um, I am new to Madison and um, I really didn't know this tiny house village was here until just recently. I joined the Raging Grannies singing group. <laughs> we're going to be here today. And, um, and I found out that we're going to sing here today. Um, so uh, to me, it's really great because I have no information on coming in here. I don't even know where you wash your hands. We have okay. three bathrooms here. Okay. Do you have washing machines or no? No, we that's have, the reason why we, we do have this. We want to expand. So to be that's able one to of the other issues with the right. soft water. We just don't have the area to lock it down to actually actually make it a permanent place for soft water. And then the soft water where we put the washer and dryer. So there's a lot of questions, a lot of conversations about it to make it permanent. Because once we put the plumbing in, it's permanent. You know, just like a regular house. And we so no, we, we just don't have the space where to put it right now. You know, that's our next space. Can we use what? A sewing machine. Yes. We have a sewing yeah, machine. We have, we have uh, the we have uh, so we do it on a, in the loom house because it, before it was called the kitchen house. Now it's called the loom house. That's where the loom is. But we do have a sewing machine. Right. But this is the, also their kitchen. Yeah, this is our okay. kitchen. So it's for now. There's for now. We need of a, we we need to, you're going to hear about phase two. But, you know, oh, right. so that, you know, during all the other days of the week and here, it's sawdust. Yeah, so sure. So that's their kitchen. Yeah. So basically the kitchen is a microwave a convention stove and an oven and we have a toaster and a coffee pot maker what else what else do you need and you know we have two pot you know two things that we warm up you know to, to uh, burners that we use a lot you know but you know it, it's workable it's camping to an it's camping 365 days a year <laughs> right now but it's okay you know we're looking forward to it, you know, when we raise all the money so we'll be able to, you know, because that's our goal, it's to have to be able to put four more houses on the property, or four, four, yeah, four more houses, and then um, have the kitchen, more showers, more bathrooms, and a um, washer and dryer. And a community room. And a community room, that would be great. <coughs> so we can, I mean, because when the, I, Chris and I, we cook a lot, we like to cook. So we end up eating a lot by ourselves, you know. So with the community room, I think people will hang out more right. together, a little bit more. And it's not full of sawdust. Yes. <laughs> Anybody else? Which high school built your houses? So we had La Follette and East High School. The wood, the, street. the yeah. wood, the wood shop uh, teachers, uh, Follett, I believe started in 2015 of the fall. I want to say. Yeah. No. 16. 16. No, because no, my house, my house is Follett. It might have been the second. It was in 14. 14. Was 14. Yeah. Because the first house arrived when we were just moving in. Okay. Yeah, 14. And we parked it. Because I moved later in in December. An with all the notes from the students. Right. Yeah, right. Uh, I moved in December of 2015. Okay. Wow. So it was, I want to say, the fall of 2014. Yes. Yeah. It's when they began building? Mm-hmm. No, that's no. when they delivered the, the first one. The first one. <coughs> we, the first one. I believe uh, Bruce, I don't know if he's here, but he was one of the lead people and working yeah, with the uh, teachers in the wood shop as to letting them know we're doing this um, Occupy Madison tiny houses. What do you think your students uh, think about homeless people on the street, can't afford housing, and we're building tiny houses. Do you think it would be good for the teachers to teach the students this as more of an educational learning experience? 
Can I say something about that? Because I've uh, we've had a couple of the La Follette students stop by to show their parents, and um, and when you, it's not also about it's about helping people um, in the community, but also skill building. A couple yeah. of them that uh, a couple of them that had stopped by to show their parents. Um, That's what they, they did. They became yeah. They the became trades. they were construction workers. Yes, they so, started the trades. So yeah. it, it really helped also with their skills. So it's multi. And when did East join? East, I think it was 2015 or 16. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they have one house. One house. We have one yeah, East. Great. I think it was 15 or 16 that East got involved. And who built the little one that's almost ready to go? The Badger house? The Badger, the badger one? was the La Follette house. La Follette. La Follette. Yeah, yeah, those two are the follets. The the, yeah, the two well, by the by you know the red and the green one are the follets. First three here are occupied. Mine and the haps yeah. are the follets. Okay, first three on this the first side. three we built. The occupied. Those are, yeah, that's this is we, yeah those and are the follets. Just felt the frame and shell. We still had to do the interior yes. insulation, wiring, everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. So yeah, they do we, the cars. We had to reach out to the high schools to uh, uh, what do they think about building tiny houses, giving more of an experience for the students and learning about the community as to why people are homeless, helping people out into housing. And um, the teachers and the students agreed where it would be more of a learning experience mm -hmm. to know how people are as in the community, how, how hard it is to live on your own and to get better skills yeah. as to learning something more by building something so big, by reading blueprints, working as a team, using different power tools. So all these skills come together later in our life and that's something more that they would learn um, in high school than if they didn't want to do a project like that. So it's more of an educational experience. <coughs> um, right now that's on hold based on if we start phase two when we're ready to start phase we just two, need one more we house. would just need one more tiny house. But also their shop their shop teacher went to Europe also. And, and they got on vacation <laughs> for some time. <laughs> that had something to do with it. If I had if I had if I had uh, if I ordered eight eight tiny houses right now, right? Eight tiny houses. Eight tiny houses. Eight tiny houses. Uh, you would have to you would have to ask the city um, for permission, but there's different uh, zoning areas. As we're a residential commercial, so it would, it would, might take some improvement based on what you want to do with eight tiny houses. So I'm going to say no. Basically, it's the city ordinances. So if you have a crisis, it might be that now that this has been successful, 
but it, it takes uh, it takes time with meetings and conversations. So every guy is going to find what kind of uses to be there and the physical characteristics of the building you can put there and how many you can put there and all that. There is so, also a city ordinance that allows churches and nonprofits to put up to, I think it was four. Um, so you can put up to four on a church property or a nonprofit property, but um, there's lots of specific rules that go with it. And if we could find these properties that met all the rules, um, we would probably do that, but right now we still haven't found the piece of property that meets all the rules. If somebody gets really serious about it, I think the council would probably change those rules a little bit if it was needed to get some houses onto another piece of property. They basically made the setback rules so strict that you would have no property left, typically, to put a house on it, because they wanted so much distance from residential and this and that. And it's based on fear of that we're bringing a negative use. Okay? Now, we're five years into showing it's not a negative use. So that's why I think you have a, anyone would have a stronger case to argue that we're talking about positive things. We don't need those protected rules that say 60 feet from the resident. So, uh, and so I think you've got a great possibility to do it. But it's a, it's a it's evolved process anyway. It took us five months. You have to. Something else you have to think about when you bring in um, people that have mental health issues or addiction issues or whatever. Or disabled. We felt that we don't have the capacity at home to deal with those issues because we need social workers and we need case workers or whatever. I mean, this is the kind of thing that's proven successful, but it's because not just anybody gets housed here. Yeah. And, and it takes and It's a not just a, a, like a motel. Right. Um, it's a commitment. The community got built before we had property yeah. and was very resilient and moved around the county 31 places before we could land. Mm -hmm. We proved 31 times that yeah. there's no legal place to be without a at least title or mortgage. So we decided, okay, I guess we got to be a landlord. And then we did this. Uh, but uh, the, the, um, the environment is still, uh, it's an uphill thing and you have to work your way through Resistance, but I think it'd be less. Right. Right. And, and, but I would be reluctant to suggest building a, a group of units without that community built first, or without that community being built as part of it. You know, the problems with the CNN three lane and uh, rest, rest ease of traffic housing places is there places in the service and everything, but. It's not really a community. It's, it's, kind of, it's, it's, uh, it's just a place you can go to. And, uh, so I think what makes this work is we have the community. These folks have worked out. And they're, they're all special, difficult people. And, uh, uh, but they have learned how to work out people amongst themselves. And they do it beautifully. And it's a self help model here. And uh, so I mean, the help comes from the outside. But the key to it is the community doing for itself whenever it and they, you know, they produce what gets sold in here. They have a, also a sustainable model for the finance. They, they come with the expenses of this whole operation out of that retail shop for about two years. Are, are you considered a mobile home community or co-housing? So, so there's a specific statue that was named. We wanted tiny houses. But the city council looked at it as it's not 100% a tiny house. So they made a special statue as shelter units. Instead well, it's, of a, a, which they are. it's more like an intentional, like a co housing, the way we operate. It's more like a co housing. Yeah. The operational model is all in But we did have one of the great things we did was the city tried to ask the state to. The view that we were one of these existing categories for campground or RV park or something. And the state did us a favor and said no to all of them. So then we got to sit down with the city and, and develop something now. And so it's a portable shelter unit. It has specific rules. It has to be on wheels. It has to have certain characteristics that all of our houses do. And so they wrote that in the ordinance. And so it's a new kind of category. So it's not subject to the regular building code. It's not subject to the you know, RVs and mobile homes have 
instruction codes also. And but we're we're not bound by any of that. We're what we're bound by is a uh, a utility trailer under three thousand pounds. We we designed it and built it very carefully to not exceed that total weight, so that we would qualify as a unregulated utility trailer. I, I worked in Wanakee for a while, and within the city of Wanakee, mobile homes are not allowed, which I thought was a very interesting. Um, you know, kind of zoning, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> which, which I, I, right, I mean, I have a big problem with that. I can't see exactly why that's even legal. Uh, well, I think an individual has the right to buy any kind of utility or RV or camping, polling kind of camp item. But... I mean, if they don't allow it or they think it's going to be an issue for illegal camping or parking on the streets. I, I mean, they have an ordinance that says, and, and I don't know how they, how they you know, define mobile homes, but mobile homes and a mobile home park is not allowed in Wanakee. And, and probably other small towns around here. I happen to know that one. So we're going to for the five minutes left, and this is the, the panel for residents. At 3 o'clock is going to be the neighborhood panel, and at, uh, my phone keeps changing on me. At 3.45 it's going to be about phase two. Is there so, any more? Is there any more? Is there any more questions for the residents? Is there any more, more, there any more questions, for the, any more questions for the residents? So, I, me... Jean, Sophia, and Chris are a resident so far. Oh, okay. Does anybody I'm sorry, what? Does anybody Oh, um, no. But Chris's house is a gas um, propane heater. Was. Was. Um, but we just have electrical burners here. No wooden stove. Do y'all get land over? Yeah. There, there are guideline rules here. We have a quiet time. Um, we have a guest policy rule. Um, we have a misconduct policy. Um, we have a chore wheel. Um, that means we rotate the chores on a property. That means we maintain the property in cleansiness. Um, but the important thing is, yep. is that we came up, as residents came up with the rules, we right. sat out there for a whole summer yep. and, and hashed out and hashed out the rules, the, the expectations that we have for each other. Yeah. We don't have we don't have a landlord dictating the rules saying we're, we're each yeah, other's we landlord. Have to be in by ten or whatever. Right. Right. Yeah. I like that. I to follow up with John about. It's us and they, us and them, and the county. That, um, up in my part of the state, you know, North, North Central, there are a lot of small cities. People think they're doing better than they really are. And one guy in one of those god awful comment pages said, Why should we help people that won't help themselves? So I think what you're showing to the whole world is. We are helping ourselves, and we could do this a little more health, maybe more leverage. But by staying as an organization, these guys are almost function like a union, you know, like organized unions to take your demands to the city, you know, and negotiate what you need. I think the more we can stay united and organized, the better it's going to be. Really well, that was a problem in the early days, right? With uh, between the house and the unhoused and the occupied. That's where um, that's I think part of why so many why so many city occupies disbanded is because they couldn't resolve that us and them, where we had. Um, Coming from a resident's point of view, as a formerly homeless person's point of view, like, like, I'm equal with a former elder, right? Like, I'm, like, <laughs> like, you know, like, there's a mutual respect, and, um, and we really have gotten rid of it. There's not, 
between verbal and abandonments that we had to do. Um, so we banded the alcohol policy to allow it on the property. And that's really important for, for a community, I think, to stay, that we have to be able to stay open-minded and, and change um, to, to whatever situation is in front of us. So. So yeah, we've changed, we actually changed quite a few. Uh, yeah, Ellen? That, that was a huge problem uh, from the beginning, um, the alcohol policy. Uh, there were a couple of residents that uh, severely objected to that policy, feeling that, you know, you guys will have your own houses, you can have a drink uh, for good dinner. But, and, and so it was allowed for, for a period of time. And then even the residents, most of the residents, came to the conclusion that this, this all this situation is not going to be. Yeah, all of this section. As overlooking the situation, we decided to ban the policy based on it's that people can't be responsible. So that's why we said no more alcohol. How we want to interact with each other. Yeah. Anybody else, or we're going to wrap it up? All right, thank you guys.